Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome dear participants. In the previous module, we had looked at the work of Emily Cox Palmer White. Palmer White has analyzed the structure of gender as a biopolitical phenomenon while appropriating Agamben's paradigmatic system as framework. While contextualizing her reworking of gender as a paradigm, she elaborates on several biopolitical fictions. In this module, we shall look at the 2017 TV adaptation of Atwood's The Handmaid Tale as a biopolitical dystopia. With reference to Palmer White's analysis, we will read biopolitics, body politics and patriarchal neoliberalism as blurring the lines of fiction and reality. The cinematic dystopic representation of Handmaid's Tale explicates the biopolitical binaries. While contextualizing gender binaries, Palmer White outlines the essentialist conceptualization of women, feminist politics, which she terms as mind cuffs of phallogocentrism, and also the intersections which exist between and amongst science fiction writing, gender theory, and biopolitics. As we recognize the role of paradigms as a tool to deconstruct gender binaries, Margaret Atwood's The Handmaid's Tale, adapted as a TV series in 2017, explores the nature of gendered body in a biopolitical dystopic universe. Let us explore the upcoming genre of biopolitical dystopic fiction and try to define it by decoding the operations of biopower over gendered categories. Biopolitics refers to the intersection and mutual incorporation of biology and political control over the body. When this intersection is employed in different ways across academic disciplines, critical theory and fiction, the term biopolitics tends to take on two meanings. Firstly, biopower is both individualized and collectivized through disciplinary technologies in order to control and manage individual bodies, especially the female bodies. Secondly, biopower intervenes at the social, biological, political and cultural hierarchies. So, what exactly is biopolitical fiction? A biopolitical fiction uses the technique of biopower for achieving subjugation of bodies and population control. The fictional accounts of the portrayal and operations of biopower can be categorized as biopolitical fiction. On the left hand side, we have a painting by an artist Anikai with the title of The Alchemy of Biofiction. Biopolitical fiction is an emerging genre which is now captivating the attention of artists as well as literary writers. The idea of control and discipline in such narratives can be achieved through violence, repression, surveillance or ideology as social conditioning. These narrative tropes are best represented in dystopias, apocalyptic fictional spaces and documentary models of storytelling. Biopower produces and exposes the literary production and reproduction of gendered norms through regulatory practices, surveillance, violence and repression in a dystopic setting. The dystopic literary spaces elaborate on the biopolitical calculus, biosovereign power and control over individuals and bodies while appropriating sex as a tool for social production and reproduction. 
However, we always encounter several questions while exploring such literary spaces. The questions we encounter can be listed as first, what is the status of a citizen and particularly what is the state of women as citizens. Secondly, can we be more than genders, sex and organs in the workings of a biopolitical paradigm? And thirdly, can the literary space of speculative fiction elucidate the operations of biopolitics in a postmodern, globalized, posthuman world? These questions will be contextualized within the virtual cinematic representation of Margaret Atwood's Handmaid's Tale, a successful Hulu TV series now is streaming on Amazon Prime. To illustrate further, let us begin with the first question and that is, what is a citizen? The citizens in a dystopic setting are subjects in the making. As some are included, some may be excluded and rendered as waste by the statues of the state. The subjectivized biopower contributes largely to biopolitical indeterminacy as well as unrest. It would be pertinent to refer to Agamben in this context and he says, I quote, the biopolitical relationship between state and citizen depends on the fact that the subject may become suspended by the law in a state of emergency. The citizen's position is tenuous as he or she can, when necessary, enter a zone of indistinction where they are both prosecuted by the full force of the law, which is including a citizen within its fold, while no longer retaining the legal rights of a citizen. That is the situation when a person can be excluded from the rights of being a citizen. Belongingness and citizenship are essential components of an individual's identity. But the exclusion of a given citizen or a group from the law may be sanctioned. It is this biopolitical indeterminacy that appears as an ambiguous and uncertain zone. Agamben sees it as a threshold where fact and law seem to be undecidable. Sometimes an individual might suffer for being a man or being a woman or a trans person or for homosexuality. Women find themselves in a marginalized state as a result of their politically defined status as women. Let us now look at the second question. Can we be more than our genders? The category is biological sex, which is a public construct and gender, which is a personal choice, determine the nature of an individual's political identity. However, the political identity attempts to hegemonize all women, whether trans or cis, fertile or infertile, intersex, etc., as subjects to the same laws regarding the regulation of female bodies, even though the biology of various female subjects may in actuality differ. The political system normally identifies women only through their biological sex. The biopolitical paradigm not only has the potential to fracture the body of an individual, but it can also generate normative oppression, violence and repression. Palmer White observes that an exemplary link between Agamben's work and feminist theory is present in his most famous and also perhaps the most controversial statement where he states that today it is not the city but rather the camp that is the fundamental biopolitical paradigm of the West. His words resonate with those of Betty Friedan's when she stated that the state of a housewife is similar to a concentration camp victim. Similarly, the devolution of an identity of an individual, especially women, to a well-functioning set of reproductive organ can make them prisoners of their own bodies. In the dystopic space, biopolitics is generally ritualized through language and underpinnings of sexual and reproductive labor. The depiction of visual violence is found in science fiction literature especially the dystopias. 
we can take the example of Handmaid's Tale by Atwood or Harlan by Charlotte Perkins Gilman, Red Clocks by Lenny Zumas or web series streaming on Netflix like Black Mirror or Waste World etc. On the other hand, in the discursive space of science fiction, gender identity outside of prescribed norms is also made possible or livable. The themes of performance and biopolitical subjectivity highlight the ways in which gender influences our lives as political subjects. Thus, dystopia constitutes a critique of existing social and political conditions contextualizing gendering. Sometimes the fictional science fiction universe is more livable for the subject because they can always fight against the system which may not be perhaps the case in their real life. Therefore, the dystopic spaces structurally provide struggle as well as rebellion. This aspect can also be seen in video games which will be taken up in the fifth module of 11th week wherein we will explore the workings of biopower in simulated video games. Hence, a study of the dystopic space allows us to be more than our genders by highlighting the problems faced by gendering. It allows us to be a receptacle of change through a cautionary tale. By combining the biopolitical paradigm and the feminist theory, Palmer White suggests that the dystopic discourse is best suited to deconstruct the discursive gendered subjects and respectively biopolitical subjectivities. For Judith Butler, as for Agamben, the private sphere of the self, for example, one's sexual desires is intertwined with one's social, cultural, political self, which makes gender a complex social and political apparatus. Palmer White finds Butler's work decidedly compatible with Agamben's understanding of the conception of life as both a personal entity and a public one forever intertwined with the lives and experiences of others. The feminist science fiction deconstructs paradigms of gender and sexuality. Butler poses a very interesting question and I quote, If I am a certain gender, will I be regarded as part of the human? Will the human expand to include me in this reach? Will there be a place for my life and will it be recognizable to the others upon which I depend for social existence." Unquote. Science fiction allows the individual to take any gender and in the post-human narrative, one can find association with animals, extraterrestrials, monsters, allowing an expansion of the body in a literary sense. Therefore, science fiction literature is a place of pure potentiality. It offers not only fantasy, but as a virtual world of fiction, it also provides the capacity for legitimacy, the chance to make unlivable life possible, if only in an imagined landscape. We can again refer to Butler's work in Undoing Gender, where she says, the thought of a possible life is only an indulgence for those who already know themselves to be possible for those who are still looking to become possible, possibility is a necessity. Since the paradigms of gender and sex have significantly changed, certain other assumptions also require some fundamental changes. For example, the assumed female duty to reproduce, to attend to the physical and emotional well-being of others, and at the same time, to place her own needs below those of others is based on the fiction that women's bodies, their instincts, skills and emotions are all designed to prepare them for these capacities. So, this perception should also change. This is one of the founding principles of biopower which accounts political control over women that produce and also maintain those lives. Control, surveillance and gendering find intersections in modern day living too. 
Therefore, modern biopolitics organizes itself in an economy of auctoritas and protestas that is government power and individual political activity or the democratic people of the people, which needs balancing. Such balancing can allow us to be more than our gender, sexual orientation, biological sex in real lives, both in public as well as personal domains. However, it still resembles a utopia. Having established the entanglement of gender, sex and biopolitics, let us move to our third and final question and that is how does discursive spaces of science fiction decode the operations of biopower. In order to address this question, let us take the example of the 2017 TV adaptation of Atwood's novel The Handmaid's Tale. It has also been discussed by Palmer White in her essay as one of her examples to elucidate on the aforementioned. However, we will move beyond White's theorizations. The novel which was first published in 1985 has always interested people and it also has immense staging power. The TV adaptation is a Hulu original which was released in 2017. The serialized version of The Handmaid's Tale reiterates the complex relation between biopolitics, women's bodies and gender, especially in the 21st century. This TV series is created by Bruce Miller. It has won Primetime Emmy Award for Outstanding Drama Series. As one of the most famous feminist dystopian depiction of women being biopolitically subjugated, to outline the entangled nature of biopolitics and gender, the text functions as a mirror to the present. It depicts the life of a young woman, Ofrit. The part of Ofrit has been played by Elizabeth Moss in the serialized narrative. She is living under a totalitarian theocracy that had overthrown the US government to form an oppressive Republic of Gilead. It treats women as property of the state and is faced with environmental disasters and also a plummeting birth rate. In a disparate attempt to repopulate a devastated world, the few remaining fertile women are forced into sexual servitude. Ofrit is one of the few remaining fertile women. She is also forced into reproductive slavery. However, she is determined to survive the terrifying world she lives in and find the daughter that was taken away from her. Handmaids is a tag by which such fertile women are known. They are assigned to the homes of the ruling elite and they must submit to a ritualized ceremony by their male masters who are known as commanders in the presence of their wives so that they can be impregnated and bear children for them. The commanders are the power centers dictating this practice. Let us watch a scene from the series as a testament to the forced ritualized ceremony depicted in the narrative both in the story and the series. In this scene we see that Ofrit or June Osborn played by Elizabeth Moss is forced into sexual servitude. Her expression depicts pain and suffering. A sense of strained rebellion is also brewing inside her. This is called the ceremony in the series depicting the foundations of Gilead. Those eggs you got today were nice and fresh. I wish they'd hurry up. Some of us got things to do, you know? Hurry up and wait. Again, as usual. 
What is it about men? The knock is prescribed, because tonight this room is her domain. Come in. It's a little thing, but in this house, little things mean everything. Good evening. Dear. Now let's get started. Rachel saw that she bare Jacob no children. Rachel envied her sister and said unto Jacob, Give me children or else I die. The series showcases the collapse of a world order due to the decline in fertility rates. The depiction of the modern anxieties about political and social problems related to gender from the biopolitical paradigm. The sinister specter of gender and patriarchal oppression haunt the totalitarian government of Gilead. In season one of The Handmaid's Tale TV series, of it poignantly portrays the connection between women pre and post Gilead. There was a way we looked at each other at the red center before you didn't ever see it, not more than a glimpse that look was terror, utter and unutterable. We witness a haunting depiction of sexual division of labor on the screen and also in this story. The act of organizing women is an act of organizing wombs. Sexualization and desexualization are integral parts of the Gileadian biopower and it is apparent in the hierarchy which this republic practices. The state of Gilead organizes women according to the text. They use the classic virgin or war dichotomy, good moral, bad immoral women and fertile barren women texts as a means of organizing women into a tiered hierarchical system. At the top are the commander's wife, particularly those who are married to powerful ones. Secondly, there are aunts who act as the keepers and teachers of the handmaids, instructing them forcibly in compliance and supplication. In the third place are the Marthas or the housekeepers and the handmaids are at the bottom of the social ladder. The aunts and the Marthas can be said to form their own distinct categories of women outside the role of wife and the childbearing handmaids. They are usually older, desexualized and divorced from traditional notions of femininity. Therefore, the body and female subjectivity with respect to the body is crucial to the roles assigned to each woman in this state. Sexual slavery, normalized violence is highlighted by the aunt's repetition that Gilead is within you. Offred's body represents the biopolitics of the gendered bodies in a true sense. In the novel, Offred states, and it is rather a longer quote, I used to think of my body as an instrument of pleasure or a means of transportation or an implement for the accomplishment of my will. However, after having spent her time in this fictionalized Republic of Gilead, she says, now the flesh arranges itself differently. I am a cloud congealed around a central object, the shape of a pear, which is more real than I am and glows red with its translucent wrappings. In the series of Red States, I was asleep before. That's how we let it happen. When they slaughtered Congress, we didn't wake up. When they blamed terrorists and disrupted the constitution, we didn't wake up then either. Now I am awake. 
I was asleep before. That's how we let it happen. When they slaughtered Congress, we didn't wake up. When they blamed terrorists and suspended the Constitution, we didn't wake up then either. Now I'm awake. You girls will serve the leaders and their barren wives. You will bear children for them. Alfred's words denote undertones of biopower. As her body has transgressed the codes of normalcy and her identity is caged in her body, which is controlled by the Republic of Gilead. Both narratives, the series and the novel, refer to Alfred's becoming one with herself as an act of rebellion. She is awake and she is a cloud. She glows red and for Gilead, red represents fertility, that is the function of the uterus of a woman. However, for Alfred, red is a performance as opposed to codified sexual labor as regimentation of social behavior. Therefore, the figuration of Alfred portrays the dehumanization of an individual through biopolitical control in a totalitarian regime. In the latest season, premiered in April 2021, which is not based on the book, we see Alfred or June fight for her freedom against the Republic of Gilead. She fights for autonomy and also for her body. The TV series also represents a color coding of the body. The handmaids wear red dress to symbolize fertility and to symbolize their function as sexual objects only. The wives of the commanders frequently view handmaids as little wards, as one wife describes handmaids in the Handmaid's Tale TV series. The wives wear blue gowns to denote purity and chastity to mark innocence in child care. This division of the women into two separate social groups demonstrates the two biopolitical functions of women within this regime. The body is color coded and that color is imprinted on the identity of a woman, even though she is completely dehumanized. In Gilead, the body narrates the story more than the individual. It becomes the receptacle of change as it is disfigured by biopolitical tools of conduct. The postmodern, post human speculative discourses operating on the themes of gender and biopower suggest that the incarcerated human body, especially the, fem the female body, is not a problem of the past but of the present as well. The impossibility of segregating sex and power as two interdependent constructs forms the biopolitics of our contemporary times. The dystopic model of the handmaid's tale explores the constraints of living in a heteronormative hierarchy. However, this dystopic model is also very much a part of the reality and not the imaginary only. To quote Donna Haraway, the boundary between science fiction and social reality is an optical illusion. We can also refer to Susan Okin Muller. In her work, Justice, Gender and the Family, she claims that women have been expected to fulfill the roles of Gilead's handmaids and wives, while simultaneously carrying out the invisible domestic labor of the Marthas. Many women choose to enter the workplace while also maintaining a family, and in such cases, it is still women who will do by far the greatest proportion of unpaid family work, such as childcare and household chores. Palmer White notes that the Gilead Society openly acknowledges the many roles of women and spreads them across various female social classes, thereby creating a kind of domestic harem for the men in power. The established relation of gender and biopower should be acknowledged to avoid such tales in the progression of biopower. Also, while recognizing the linguistic markers of power and dominance, we should read this speculative space, especially dystopia, to understand the vulnerable positioning of women as sexualized others in real life. Some recent examples of feminist, science fiction or speculative fiction 
dealing with the question of biopolitics are Mad Max Fury Road, directed by George Miller, The Power by Naomi Alderman, Unbelievable by ProPublica, and The Marshall Project is streaming now on Netflix. To conclude and continue this discussion further, we can say that in order to achieve gender equality and progress towards gender sustainability, we should acknowledge the impact of biopower on gender and on genders. Following this line of inquiry and foregrounding the intersections of gender and biopolitics, the next segment will focus on the sexual politics of the term gender as explained by Donna Haraway. This discussion on the textual, linguistic and sexual politics of the term gender shall provide a holistic understanding of biopower and gender. Thank you.